Um, so why on earth would uh, my data invite somebody from a statistical organization to, to speak at their conference? Uh, I mean, the short answer is that we were into data well before any of you were interested in it. Uh, the RSS has been around for 184 years now, so uh, st statisticians, I think, bring uh, a lot to the table when thinking about uh, the kinds of issues that the My Data conference is exploring. In particular, uh, issues around good governance, transparency, transparency, explainability, privacy, de-identification. Statisticians have been thinking about all of these issues for a very long time uh, and can bring something to the debate, as it were. The Royal Statistical Society uh, a, f a few years ago launched a, a data manifesto, uh, which was to help policymakers understand the value of data. Uh, and we put it in their terms, so it's not about us pushing data to them, but us saying, how do we meet the goals of your agendas, prosperity, democracy, better policymaking? Uh, and so that manifesto contained the sorts of things that you would expect to see more evidence-based policymaking, better data skills, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but some quite interesting campaigns came out of it, uh, including uh, the RSS working with others to push for more uh, clinical trials to be registered. So pharmaceutical companies can't just publish the ones which go in the direction uh, that say that their new drug is positive, but if, if it's not a very good trial, they can just not publish it. If every trial is registered, then they're forced to uh, publish it, whether it's a, a good or bad outcome. We also uh, have campaigned in our elections for uh, our parliamentarians to take statistical training, uh, and so uh, actually increasing the skill level of our politicians uh, in basic statistics and data. So uh, the RSS, as a body of statisticians, I think, has a lot to contribute to, to the sorts of debates we're having uh, around the table uh, here. I was asked to say a few words just talking about the UK landscape as it stands at the moment. Uh, there have been a lot of parliamentary inquiries uh, in the sorts of things we've been discussing. So there's been a parliamentary inquiry on big data, one on artificial intelligence, uh, and another one on algorithms in policy making. So our parliamentarians are getting worked up about the right sorts of things. Uh, we also have a number of institutions uh, working in this space. We, of course, have our Information Commissioner's Office, uh, which is the data protection body. Uh, there is also a new government centre for data ethics and innovation, uh, which is just in the process of being set up. Uh, and there is also a new Ada Lovelace Institute, uh, which the RSS uh, called to be set up, which is an independent body, a kind of foresight body to think about digital and data ethics uh, completely independent from government, uh, paralleling the Council for Bioethics, which was set up uh, over 20 years ago and had uh, a lot of influence on the bioethical uh, debates that have happened uh, around the world. So uh, we also have strong civil society representation uh, in the debates that are happening, including uh, the Open Data Institute, the Royal Statistical Society, uh, Dot Everyone, and many other NGOs as well. So I would say that the, the UK ecosystem is in uh, quite a good place at the moment, uh, although it's probably worth saying that there, there's yet to be seen a kind of potential tension between the Information Commissioner's Office having regulatory powers and the new Centre for Data Ethics, uh, having these two separate bodies concerned with broadly similar agendas, how will that pan out, could be fractured. So we shall see. I was asked to say a few words about how we deal with data monopolies, which from my perspective is one of the major issues that we currently face. Now, it's clear that uh, breakup is unlikely uh, from a kind of political perspective, taking on the sort of tech titans uh, is not that likely. And also it's worth saying that uh, breakup of uh, the large tech companies would also reduce the consumer benefits from the network effects that they have. Uh, and so breakup, uh, which is a sort of traditional monopoly tackling tool, is not necessarily the right one to use in, the, in these circumstances. So what other options might we have? Uh, one uh, which I would really recommend, which we've taken up in the UK, uh, that the, the RSS and others fought for our National Statistical Institute, the Office for National Statistics, to have a new right to access private sector data. 
Uh, so this is now a right that our National Statistical Institute possesses, uh, which is very powerful, uh, and it means that uh, instead of, for example, having to do a census every 10 years, which we will still continue to be doing, but that data degrading over time, uh, our statistical office will now be able to start using private sector data to get a much more real-time picture of what's happening in the UK. And that is purely for statistical purposes. Uh, so this is not government getting its hands on data for other operational purposes, but purely for statistical purposes. So that's one area where I think uh, you can use the data monopoly that the private sector has around certain kinds of data, but reposition it for public good for statistical purposes. So I recommend every statistical agency to try and get that legislated for. A second area, I think, is uh, algorithmic accountability. Uh, now, this is something that's already been discussed uh, at this conference and you'll be familiar with. The point I wanted to make is that the issue is really one about procurement. Uh, often these uh, algorithm uh, kind of private sector companies will come waving the magic of uh, a new algorithm which will solve a policymaker's problem. Uh, and the issue that we're trying to remind policymakers uh, is that you, for the large part, have the data, and the magic is in the data, not in the algorithms, because the algorithm is really requiring the data to train uh, itself on. And so don't just give this away too quickly. You need strong contracting, uh, pushing for good governance, uh, transparency, publication, accountability mechanisms, and the state has got considerable power at this stage where the state is holding uh, important data sets, for example, health data in the UK. So uh, I think that we're in quite a good position uh, in principle to push for more algor algorithmic accountability, although in practice civil servants haven't tended to have a good record on procurement, so we shall see. A third area uh, to think about for data monopolies uh, is uh, looking at uh, intellectual property rights as a model. So uh, in the very short run, I'm not too bothered about uh, companies using data that they take from uh, me and then using it to sell me new products. What worries me much more is well, where will we be in 30 or 40 years time? Who will amass these massive data sets which tell us a lot about the world around us? Uh, and I don't want to be in a place where it's the private sector that ha has those kind of walled garden data sets which none of the rest of us can benefit from, as it were. So one potential model to deal with that would be uh, that the way that we deal with intellectual property rights is companies have a, a, a short uh, period of time where they're allowed to hold on to uh, intellectual property, but after that, uh, that, that expires and they no longer have that right. Is there a similar uh, time expiration that we could use around data, uh, which might either mean that they then have to erase the data entirely, uh, or uh, if we're thinking about the common good, to transfer that data into some uh, public interest uh, NGO, uh, which researchers and others could then access that data. Uh, so I, I would feel far more comfortable with that kind of a model. This would parallel, for example, what happened with the Human Genome Project. Some of you may remember uh, there was a race uh, between a private sector developer, uh, Craig Venter, who wanted to uh, sequence the human genome for private gain, uh, and others led by John Sulston, who wanted to do it uh, in an open access way, which uh, all of scientists could benefit from. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I, John Selston won that race, uh, and thankfully for us, because uh, many of us have benefited from it. So that, that's a potential model. The fourth point on data monopolies is, uh, uh, and this is less about data and more about monopolies, but you could tax uh, large data monopoly companies as utilities. Uh, if we think of them as utilities, if there's no real way of opting out of the services that they provide uh, and they're gaining uh, megabucks, uh, the way you deal with that is through taxing them like they are a utility and there are kind of well-known economics principles for doing that. So that's just a sort of little tour around some of the ideas floating around to think about data monopolies. Uh, a few more points I wanted to touch upon. One was uh, this debate that's been going on within this conference and others around uh, data ownership. Uh, so it seems to be the, the notion of my data uh, being something that I own clearly has some value in trying to convince uh, a fairly inert public that there's something they ought to be doing here. 
But in practice, I think uh, uh, this is not a good route to go down. So uh, on the one hand, it seems to me uh, legally incoherent. I don't actually own uh, my data. Uh, the data is usually relational, as been pointed out many, many times. Uh, it may bear upon many people, or it may come out of an interaction with a GP or uh, some other part of the state. Uh, so it's data about me rather than uh, data that I own. Uh, it's also not obvious that uh, it really has translated into a galvanizing mechanism. Uh, that the sorts of uh, things we've heard about kind of data cooperatives and uh, the sort of my data uh, kind of movement around taking personal control of data hasn't really got off the ground except for a few activists, as it were. Uh, still many people don't use their basic privacy settings. So uh, this may be heresy, but I, I don't want to spend my evenings thinking about my privacy settings or kind of major data issues. I'd like somebody to have taken care of those, uh, and that suggests a data rights framework rather than forcing this down to the data individual, as it were. And uh, the sort of my data concept reinforces the notion of a kind of very individualistic uh, society. Uh, so, you know, that, that leads to a situation logically where you're talking about trading away your data, or uh, even more perniciously, the idea of, well, opting out of giving your data for health research, but being very happy to benefit from all the others who have put in. And so there is that tension there. That, uh, so I, I prefer the idea of thinking about our data rather than my data, uh, and a rights model rather than uh, uh, the, the, the idea of uh, individual ownership. Final point uh, I wanted to make was around, uh, again, what do statisticians bring to the table? Uh, and the other area where I think statisticians really focus is around uncertainty, uh, inference, uh, reliability of data. And I think as we start moving into a space where data is being used to help inform policy making, especially uh, through algorithms, it will become in increasingly important to have uh, the knowledge that comes out of it to be reliable. Uh, and we've just seen earlier this week, I don't know how many of you saw it, uh, a major paper uh, published showing that uh, social science experiments which were published in uh, the journals Nature and Science, many of them are very difficult to reproduce if you try to do them again. Uh, and this is part of what is being discussed within the science world as a reproducibility crisis of science. If science is finding it hard to base itself upon reliable data, then I think that uh, the, the world of startups has got to tread very carefully. And I think this is where uh, statisticians and data scientists uh, have a really important role to play. I look forward to uh, a further conversation uh, with all of you uh, as we go on. Thank you.